Welcome everyone. Um, as we wait for participants to join us, uh, please hold tight. We're going to give folks a few minutes to join before we get started. Um, but I appreciate all of you joining us and I uh, hope you will enjoy this webinar. Um, please just hold tight for a few minutes. Thank you. Welcome to everyone who's joining us. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, we're gonna wait a few more minutes, probably about two more minutes uh, to allow time for uh, attendees to, to sign in and then we will get started. Again, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll start in about one minute. We want to give folks a few minutes to to log on and and be prepared. So thanks so much for your patience, and we'll get started in, in just a minute. All right, uh, well, let's get started. Um, my colleague Alicia, would you mind uh, loading up the presentation so we can get started, please? Always uh, a new adventure figuring out how these technologies work <laughs> um, and uh, but we will uh, be on our way shortly. Thanks so much everyone for your patience. Okay, great. It looks like we are ready to get started. Well, welcome everyone. Um, Good morning if you're uh, here on the west coast of the U.S. in California as I am, uh, or good afternoon if you're in another part of the world, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Moira Burse, and I am the Climate and Finance Director at Amazon Watch, uh, and I am very pleased to be moderating this panel um, that uh, will really illuminate both the risks and threats to the Amazon and to the indigenous peoples who live in the Amazon, but also the ways that European banks are supporting some of those threats to the Amazon rainforest and its peoples through their trade finance of oil trade. So um, I want to start, uh, please, with the next slide, uh, help with instructions on how to use the interpretation equipment. Um, we will be having a panelist speak in Spanish, and I think we may have uh, attendees who would prefer to listen to the material in Spanish. So if you are one of those people, please click on the glow button that you'll find at the bottom of your screen where it says interpretation, uh, and you will be given an option to listen to English. So that will help you if you want interpretation into English when the Spanish speaker is presenting, or please select Spanish if you would like interpretation into uh, Spanish when English speakers are speaking. Um, please, uh, there are instructions on the screen, um, and please uh, post uh, in the chat if you're having difficulties with that, and one of my colleagues can, can help work you through it. Excellent. Okay, next slide, please. 
So today uh, we will, here's our agenda. We'll hear first from <laughs> yours truly with a brief introduction on, uh, on the report uh, that Amazon Watch and Stand recently released and on the Amazon Sacred Headwaters region more generally. Uh, Angeline Robertson, who is an investigative researcher at the Stand Research Group, will present on the methodology of the report. Uh, we will then hear from my colleague, Kevin Koenig, uh, who is the Climate and Energy Director at Amazon Watch, talking about the toxic legacy and future of Amazon crude in the region. We'll then be honored to hear from Marlon Vargas, who's the president of, the, of COFRINAI, which is the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of the Ecuadorian Amazon. And he'll be speaking about really the impacts of uh, the extractive industry, in particular the oil industry in, in the Amazon and the impacts on indigenous peoples there. Um, and then Tyson Miller, uh, SAMS Forest Programs Director, will be talking about the global campaign that we are launching uh, to, to hold corporate actors accountable. And then we will have some time for questions and answers. Uh, I ask that folks, as your questions come up, please put them in the Q&A box. So at the bottom of your screen, next to where you found the globe for interpretation, is a Q&A option. Um, and you can type in questions there. Colleagues of ours will answer questions that are sort of quick and easy. Um, as we go ahead, they'll answer them in writing. And then we will note questions that are like a little bit more complex or particularly directed at one of the panelists that we can then, then answer in, um, in the question and answer section. So please put your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat. Thanks so much. All right, next slide. Okay, so again, this, this webinar uh, is really focusing on and timed with the release of a new report from Stand.Earth. Uh, released just uh, about a month ago, in which we detailed how European banks are financing the trade of controversial oil from the Amazon sacred headwaters region in Ecuador to international destinations in the U.S., uh, such as here in California. Uh, so first I want to start with uh, presenting why we were talking about the Amazon sacred headwaters region in particular and, and what that even is. Next slide. So uh, the Amazon Sacred Headwaters region is located in the Western Amazon, um, and it encompasses the headwaters that eventually flow into the Amazon River. Uh, the area covers uh, over 74 million acres of rainforest and wetlands. Next slide. Yeah, the, the, the Amazon Sacred Headwaters region is one of the most biodiverse places in the world. There are more species of trees uh, grown in one hectare than in the US and Canada combined. Next slide. Uh, the, the sacred headwaters region also contains the highest concentration of plant, bird, mammal, and amphibian species in the Amazon and very likely the world. Next slide. Um, and very importantly, this region is home to more than 20 indigenous nationalities representing over 500,000 people. And that includes people living in voluntary isolation, so indigenous nationalities that don't have contact uh, with the outside world right now and, and are therefore extremely vulnerable. Next slide, please. So ecologically, the Amazon is not just uh, important in the region, but globally. Uh, the volume of water that cycles through the Amazon uh, can influence rainfall as far away as California, India, and China. Next slide. And uh, this one is particularly salient for me as I'm based in California and dealing with the wildfires that, that we're having right now. Uh, some models show that the Amazon impacts 20% of California's rainfall, which is half of the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And we could really use that rainfall right now here in California. Next slide. So as we've seen, there's a lot to defend and protect in the Amazon secret headwaters region. Um, but that's all at risk from industrial extraction, uh, in particular oil drilling. Um, oil drilling in the Amazon rainforest is exceedingly harmful to the climate, to the biodiversity of the rainforest, and to the many indigenous nations that are there. Um, and this, in part, is, is due to the reckless nature in which the industry operates, which has led to massively harmful spills and other contamination, which we will hear about from other panelists in a, in a bit. 
So that's why we think this, that any kind of investment in this industry deserves scrutiny um, and part of what led us to, to our report. Next slide, please. So our report uh, reveals how since 2009, European banks and other private financial institutions have provided trade financing for approximately 155 million barrels of oil from Ecuador to refineries in the US uh, for a total of $10 billion US. Um, uh, and actually more than 40% of those exports go to refineries in California alone. And, and we'll be publishing new research on that uh, very soon. So this oil contains approximately 66 million metric tons of carbon, um, which is equivalent to the annual emissions from 17 coal-fired power plants. Um, and, and as you see, if you, if you click one more, you'll uh, pop up at least another graph. Just make a click in the area. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so as you see from this trend line, uh, financial support to the Amazon oil trade has increased in recent years. So thus, we argue that these banks are actively complicit in the impacts of Amazon oil, which we'll hear about throughout this presentation, despite having made previous human rights and, and climate commitments. So now I'll pass it on to Angeline, who will explain the methodology in our report. Um, and, and we will uh, have a small section after Angeline presents uh, for, for specific questions on the methodology before we get into uh, more on the oil industry legacy impacts on the ground and the campaign. All right, Angeline, take it away. Thanks, Moira. Uh, just a quick check if everyone can hear me fine. Um, and uh, to next slide, please. So I'm going to be talking about methodologies for tracking Amazon oil and tracking trade financing for Amazon oil. And just to let you know, I'm a part of the Stand Research Group. I'm based out of British Columbia on the west coast of Canada. And the Stand Research Group has specialized in supply chain research and investigations for over 15 years, with an emphasis on fossil fuels and deforestation driver commodities. Our research reveals new leverage points, linkages, market-driven actions and um, that help campaigns to create, uh, create influence. And we have developed innovative methodologies to track commodities from physical points of negative environmental and or social impact to branded companies down the supply chain. To date, we've completed over 400 projects and our research has inspired over 100 corporate commitments to end deforestation and to help protect and we've helped protect over 30 million acres of forests. This research began in 2016 by our Sand Research Group Director Greg Higgs. Very briefly, the idea here was to map all of the crude streams in the Amazon sacred headwaters using the API and sulfur content of the oil as defining characteristics and then linking the crude streams to US Energy Information Agency data on foreign crude oil imports by US refineries depicted in this very simplified map. Greg realized that almost all of the oil exported from the Amazon came from Ecuador and the majority of it went to California. Next slide, please. The average proportion of Amazon oil exports breaks down between South American refining and consumption and North American refining and consumption, with some minor consumption by the rest of the world. In California alone, Marathon and Chevron refineries consume 29% of the Amazon oil exported, while the rest of California refineries take on another 13%. This means, and next slide please, that California has on average consumed, sorry, next slide please, consumed about 42% of all Amazon oil exported annually in the last six years. That's a big share. Next slide please. So what does the supply chain for Amazon sacred headwaters from Amazon sacred headwaters to California look like for crude oil? Well, oil flows from the rainforest from places such as the Napo Tigre, which is home to uncontacted peoples, and Yasuni National Park, which is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet, through the midstream and ends up at one of California's refineries. In this case, Chevron El Segundo, one of the biggest consumers of Amazon oil in the world. Before it arrives there, it can go through several midstream trades. Now in 2020, we revised our data set and added an analysis of exports from Peru and Ecuador and imports from the United, to the United States using US vessel tracking data or customs data. 
and we mapped out the distribution networks for diesel, gas, and jet fuel in California. And from this, I calculated the average proportion of Amazon oil going to private and leaser fleets, gas stations, airports, and here you can see some of the major brands that would be consuming Amazon oil. Next slide, please. As a result, a steady proportion of California's fuel consumption is Amazon derived. Over the past six years, approximately one in 10 gallons or 10% of jet fuel, gasoline and carb diesel pumped in the state comes from the Amazon sacred headwaters. A person could drag, drive the length of the Amazon River 6.5 million times on the crude oil con that California consumes from these headwaters annually. In addition, well, oh, no, sorry, just stay there. Back one slide, please. Thanks. In addition, while analyzing customs data for imports into the United States in the, in the past 12 months, I noticed that Rabobank was a consignee on a cargo of Napo crude sailing from Esmeraldas in Ecuador to the port of Los Angeles. And this was unique because I knew the bank and I knew they had a strong sustainability commitment. In a previous job, I'd been in their offices in Utrecht um, to discuss forest certification and financing and was familiarized with their sustainability practices. So as I sort of pulled this thread, um, I realized that even in just this last 12 months or my preliminary data set, there were at least six banks who were consignees on bills of lading, which means they were buying Amazon oil. A quick internet search revealed that they had similar sustainability commitments to Rabobank. For example, they were signatories on the equator principles, or they were signatories to the UN principles um, for responsible banking, or even the collective commitment to climate action, which is a subset of the UN principles for responsible banking. And they also had various oil and gas finance exclusion policies including, for example, excluding oil projects that do not have the free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples, and excluding oil projects that occur in internationally recognized protected areas. Amazon oil, it, it qualifies on both of those fronts. Um, so it was very interesting to me to see how far this went back. I bought nine more years of data to see if banks buying Amazon oil was a blip, a recent development, or something else. Next slide, please. It turns out it was a major trend. 19 banks were involved in trading and fi trade financing for Amazon oil from the sacred headwaters from January 2009 to June 2020. The top six, UBS Switzerland, Rabobank, Natixis, ING Belgium, Credit Suisse, and BNP Paribas accounted for 85% of the volume of oil financed about 155 million barrels of Amazon oil. The banks had extended an estimated $10 billion in credit to US refineries and oil companies to buy oil from the Amazon. And while the banks have all made various project finance commitments to emit extreme oil, all but one, Credit Suisse, had left trade financing out of the picture. And this is a major loophole. Banks who are making important strides on restricting project financing for climate, environment, and indigenous rights are supporting the market for and profiting from the trade in Amazon oil. When indigenous leaders have been sounding the alarm for years that this oil is bad for them, bad for the climate, bad for the rainforest. Next slide, please. So how did we know that this was trade financing. One traditional method of trade finance is a letter of credit. It's usually extended by the bank to the seller on behalf of the buyer. And this is a very simplified diagram of the transactions included in a letter of, in letter of credit financing. Broadly, once the seller ships the goods, the bank receives the bill of lading, sends the payment and collects from the buyer. To ensure that the bank can collect from the buyer, they take delivery of the shipment, which means they're the consignee on the bill of lading in the customs data. And that, therefore, this type of transaction is traceable since the issuing bank or the bank that extended the credit is visible in the customs data. Additionally, since they're extending credit for a, on a transaction by transaction basis, we can estimate that the volume of financing is roughly equal to the landed value of the transaction. 
And that's how we get an estimate of approximately $10 billion USD in trade financing. Next slide, please. We also identified that most of the banks were European and almost half were based in Switzerland. In fact, 33% of all globally traded oil is bought and sold in Geneva. This led to research on the Swiss transit trade in crude oil, revealing the risk to commodity producing countries such as Ecuador of remaining poor and indebted while the midstream trade, aided by trade finance, shifts resource revenues out of the country. Transit trade is also a vehicle for illicit financial flows. This suggests that the structure of trade financing, not just the money that flows through it, can enable environmental destruction because trade financing injects liquidity into transit trade markets that are opaque and poorly regulated. Swiss researchers concluded that eight to $15 billion USD per year is a realistic estimate of the illicit financial flows to Switzerland alone related to the commodity trade. Given the data limitations due to lack of transparency and oversight, this number still must be approached as a conservative estimate. We must close the loopholes of trade financing and ask banks to be accountable for their role in Amazon forest destruction. Trade finance should be an explicit part of all bank oil exclusion policies. There can be no loopholes. Banks should also make trade financing contingent on better transparency and oversight for all commodities so that transit trade cannot profit from global inequity and financial secrecy. Thanks, Moira. I'll pass it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Angeline. That was really clear. Um, I don't see any questions about uh, the methodology in the, in the Q&A. Um, if anyone has one urgent one that they want to uh, type in immediately, uh, please do so. Um, but barring that, I think we can actually move on to our next panelist. I'll wait another minute or two uh, while I see if anyone wants to throw up their proverbial hand <laughs> for a question on methodology. Um, but I'm not seeing that. So yeah, and we can we can continue then with um, with our next panelist, Kevin. And um, also, folks can know in the audience that if you do have a question um, that does come up, um, then we can. Um, we can answer it in the Q&A at the end. Um, and I do see a question, yeah, about um, uh, the, how have the banks responded and whatnot, and that will be um, something that we can address at the end in the general Q&A. Um, that's also about methodology. So um, why don't we pass it on then to uh, my colleague, Kevin Koenig um, from Amazon Watch. Kevin, are you ready to present? I am, thank you, Moira. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, why we need to close these financial loopholes that we just heard about um, on crude production in the Amazon because uh, the extraction, the transportation of Amazon crude is devastating rainforest, biodiversity, violating indigenous rights, and it's a time bomb for the planet. Um, if we want to move this slide forward. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of oil's toxic legacy in Ecuador, um, current contamination from existing production and the threat of future expansion. Um, next slide. So um, oil extraction um, began in Ecuador in the 1960s. Um, at that time, Texaco, now Chevron, entered into pristine rainforests, uh, the indigenous territory of five nationalities, and uh, began extraction. They built over 300 wells, uh, 300 miles worth of roads, uh, and it was devastating to the region and its people. Um, you can see here these stats on the right. Um, Chevron operated there for 30 years. And you know these stats here are are official. You know these are official stats. Um, so who knows? You know uh, what uh, all the things that were happening that were not you know not documented, right? Um, but essentially, what happened there? Um, you know, 
this infrastructure was and oil operations were built to spill. Um, they basically constructed unlined waste pits, as you can see, here's a, a photo here, right? Um, you can understand what happens there in a tropical rainforest where, uh, where it rains, those can overflow um, and spill directly into, uh, you know, riverways, tributaries, etc. cetera. Um, Texaco at the time, uh, they basically saved $3 a barrel um, by not properly re-injecting toxic waste water. So they dumped uh, 4.3 gallons of produced waters directly into the Amazon uh, ecosystem, directly into water that communities were using to, uh, to drink, to fish, to bathe. Um, the company also, together with the Ecuadorian state oil company, Petro, uh, Petro Ecuador, uh, they built a transnational pipeline, right, to extract crude from the Amazon um, 300 plus miles long. It snakes along the Coca River, it goes up over the Andes and down to the, to the uh, Pacific coast um, where the oil gets to the, uh, you know, on, as Angeline just explained, gets on boats and, and heads here to California. Um, We'll hear more about that pipeline in a little bit, but uh, the, the point is, you know, everything that was constructed out there um, was done on the cheap and uh, basically because people and the Amazon, um, you know, were, were, not, were not important to, to, to Chevron. And the devastation from those 30 years of extraction is the result of the ongoing um, litigation of Maria Guinda versus Chevron that a lot of you have probably heard about. This was the beginning of the extraction uh, industry in Ecuador. Um, and there's even, you know, we know that back in the day, Petrobras from Brazil sent a team of engineers to this area to see how not to extract oil. Um, not that they're doing a better job of it in Brazil, but, um, you know, Texas, uh, Chevron um, was, became um, the, you know, the, the poster child for reckless uh, oil extraction operations in the Amazon. Next slide. Here's, uh, there we go. Yeah, so here's just an example of one of those toxic waste pits. There was a thousands of the thousand of those that were left behind. Um, there has never been proper remediation of this area. There has never been clean water provided to the people uh, by the company or the government. Um, and there's never been any compensation to people that, that live in this region. Next. Uh, so, you know, it's not a surprise then, right, that um, you have uh, a high human, um, you know, the cost on the communities that, uh, that live out there amongst this oil infrastructure. Um, it's no surprise that people are sick, right? We see elevated levels of cancers, of respiratory ailments, miscarriages, birth defects, um, skin disease. This is, uh, here's a photo of uh, the Doña Rosana and who lost her son to cancer. Um, next photo, please. So fast forwarding, um, you know, again, this region, you know, so we're talking about where current production is happening has this toxic legacy of, you know, that started back in the 60s and things have not gotten much better. Um, it was mentioned earlier, you know, at the outset of the presentation about a recent oil spill that happened back in April, um, spilled 15,000 barrels, um, almost 30,000 Quechua indigenous people who live along this river uh, have been, been affected. Um, you know, two pipelines ruptured, the state oil company's pipeline and the OCP pipeline. And these are, again, these are the pipelines that snake, they go from the Amazon over the Andes, um, and they were built through um, along the Coca River and through a, uh, an area known for seismic activity. They pass at the base of a volcano. Um, so this, it's an incredibly risky area. Uh, and so the spill brought down both of those pipelines. Um, and one of the main reasons uh, was due to uh, regressive erosion from a dam project uh, along the Coca River that basically um, you know, brought down uh, both of these pipelines. And the problem is that um, 
this erosion is continuing, right? So this is, there's going to be an ongoing problem of spills uh, along, along uh, the pipeline route for the foreseeable future because um, the erosion is continuing um, and the government has no plan to, um, to do anything about it. Next slide. Here is a photo. Um, you can see, you know, on the left, uh, those are both of those pipelines, right? So that was just dumping, um, dumping crude into the rivers that um, the indigenous communities are are using. Again, this is their source of water. Um, it's their source. Uh, you know, also understand it's a pandemic, right, out there, and so there's a, you know, indigenous people. Um, you need clean water, not only to fish and bathe, but also and drink, but also to be, you know, during a time of pandemic, um, you need to be washing hands and you can't do that if your oil or your river is filled with oil. Um, in response uh, to basically to this contamination and these spills, um, Indigenous people brought a legal action for emergency protective measures because the both the government nor the companies have been properly responding. And um, during that, um, those hearings, which um, took place over the last couple of months, you know, some of the, the what we heard from companies, um, you know, were just absurd arguments, you know, things like, you know, nature replenishes itself, you know, all these justifications of why um, then you um, need to do the scope of cleanup that communities were, were demanding. Um, I had a stat on that last slide also about, um, you know, the companies say they provided clean water to communities, uh, but again, they gave them three liters of water per person per week when the World Health Organization estimate that what is needed for survival during a pandemic is 15, you know, so um, these communities have been abandoned by the state and by these companies. Um, and disturbingly, uh, both the Ministry of the Environment and these companies have um, called off their cleanup. They say it's done, it's cleaned up. Uh, and so, um, and they're, they're looking to just close the chapter on this. We can move forward to the next slide. Next slide, please. And yeah, let's go one more. Oh, sorry, back one. Back one more, back. Back one more. Sorry, we're doing it old school. And back one more. There we go. Great. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. But another thing to, to just uh, to talk about for a second when we talk about the current um, state of oil operations um, and concurrent state of contamination that's happening in this region um, is the gas flaring, right? Um, it's a major source of respiratory ailments for communities that, that, um, that live near these, these separation stations. Um, this flaring is not monitored at all um, by the government. Um, again, you can imagine, imagine asthma, respiratory ailments that um, all these communities are dealing with, you know, again, particularly um, troubling during, uh, you know, a, a pandemic of, uh, uh, you know, respiratory uh, ailment and born illness, right? Um, that's, that's, you know, hitting people who have asthma particularly hard. This is a, this is a way in which we see contamination exacerbating the impact on, on um, local communities during a, during a pandemic. Um, one important thing here to note though, well, two things I would say, you know, these gas flares are burning 24 seven. You can imagine, you know, you're in the middle of a rainforest. This is like a candle in a forest. You can, if you've ever, if you walked around the base of these, you can see, you know, the impact of the, um, you know, the biodiversity, et cetera, of an Amazon, of the Amazon rainforest. Um, you know, all kinds of animals and insects are drawn to that light and that, and that heat and, um, in, in during the day and, and the evening. So it's taking the toll on, on biodiversity. Um, but what is very inspiring though, is a group of young um, people that in communities that live near these, these flares have brought legal action uh, and very using similar arguments to the climate litigation that we've seen in the United States brought by youth around the impact um, 
on climate and, um, and future generations, right? Um, okay, next slide. So now looking forward, right? Um, and, and this is um, what's incredibly, you know, disturbing. Um, when uh, new expansion plans um, are in the works um, for expanding existing production, but then also new exploration. Right, we see industry pushing deeper and deeper into frontier forests, right? As all that easy oil has been extracted, they're looking for new reserves. Um, Angeline mentioned earlier plans, you know, where oil was coming from Yasuni National Park. The plans to develop um, wells there, we're looking at over 600, right? In an area that's a UNESCO biosphere reserve, there's indigenous people living in voluntary isolation. Um, and of course, it's a, it's a national park. Um, let's move, uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, let's see, sorry. Yeah, one more. Perfect. Um, this is the extraction plans for Ecuador's Amazon, right? You can see uh, the areas that we were talking about that have been impacted by, by Texaco, now Chevron, and where a lot of the current production is, those are all those light green um, blocks up there. Um, the areas of new extraction are these yellow kind of gold colored ones in the bottom right hand corner of the southeastern part of Ecuador's Amazon. Um, so, you know, the government plans, you know, because they've been so hard, they've been impacted by, um, uh, by the oil pro price crash, they've been impacted by, by COVID. Um, and one of the ways they hope to restart their economy is by new oil extraction. Um, so this is where the expansion is, is being planned. You know, it seems like, you know, the Amazon seems like the last place in the world that we should be looking for, um, you know, new fossil fuel reserves when we know that, you know, currently operating oil and gas fields alone um, will take the world beyond the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, limit. Um, you know, we need to keep two thirds of fossil fuels in the ground. So why are we looking for, why are we looking for more, right? Um, and the worst case, what we're, you know, the worst thing about what we're seeing here is that we're drilling for, you know, what are essentially unburnable hydrocarbons, um, you know, beneath standing forests, which are so essential for uh, climate change mitigation. Um, so, you know, it, that's where you kind of, it, it is really a time bomb for the planet to be looking for unburnable oil, uh, you know, non-Paris agreement um, compliance, uh, you know, extraction happening. Um, another thing to understand too is all these areas are indigenous territories. And so these blocks, these concessions are being handed out and they plan to be tendered to companies um, with no uh, free prior informed consent of local indigenous peoples. Currently Ecuador's constitution, there is no regulation around um, obtaining the proper consent of indigenous communities. So um, these are, you know, we're seeing egregious violation of, of indigenous rights um, to move forward in this area. Um, the other thing also to just mention, it was in that last slide, is that, you know, the oil industry is a major driver of deforestation in the Western Amazon, right? Both, um, there's a high correlation between deforestation um, in the individual blocks at the well sites, but also, again, it's a driver, right? It's, uh, the oil industry is often the first, um, you know, industry to go into that frontier forest that then they open up well pads, they open up roads, and then it's agribusiness and other, um, you know, logging um, companies, et cetera, that follow that in, right? So um, next slide. Great. So, um, you know, wh what's the good news? You know, here is the good news, basically. Um, you know, indigenous people um, on the ground through local organizing, through legal actions, you know, combined with international advocacy and the work that I think we all are doing around targeting these banks, um, it's, it's been effective. It's been effective at keeping some of the worst egregious projects at bay. It's been effective at um, halting or at least slowing, right, the, um, the government plans to auction some of these new blocks. Um, and I think it does send a huge message to, um, to banks that, um, you know, there's incredible amount of risk associated with these projects. We're seeing um, that resistance is effective. It's stranding these assets, it's stranding oil reserves. Um, and that companies and banks that are involved in these projects, if you don't have a social license to operate, 
right? Um, your project is going to be uh, fraught with problems. So um, I'm going to stop there. And then um, I believe Marlon Vargas is going to follow and he's going to take it from here about um, all the efforts that indigenous people are doing to defend their territories. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that illuminating presentation. And yes, we are going to hear now from Marlon Vargas, the president of the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of uh, the Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, Marlon, um, te invitamos a iniciar la presentación y por favor poner eh, su video para, para poder verte. Marlon, ¿estás listo? Eso, sí, lo sí, vemos. Sí, estoy listo. Adelante. Creo que está bien. Sí, Marlon, adelante. Muchas gracias eh, por permitirnos a las nacionalidades de pueblos indígenas de la Amazonía ecuatoriana con Feñé para poder compartir y, y decir lo que está pasando. Wow. Tengo problema. Ahí creo. Ahí. Muchas gracias por la invitación eh, a todos quienes están pues en este espacio. Eh, quiero saludar primeramente a nombre de la Confederación de Nacionalidades Indígenas de la Amazonía Ecuatoriana, CONFENIAI. Eh, somos 11 nacionalidades, 23 organizaciones. Eh, Estamos en la Amazonía Norte, Centro y Sur. Hace 50 años en la Amazonía Norte, pues eh, nos dijeron de que la explotación petrolera era desarrollo de los pueblos indígenas. Pero en estos 50 años de explotación petrolera en la Amazonía Norte, Simplemente ha sido destrucción de la madre naturaleza, de la Pachamama, de nuestros ríos, de, nuestros, de nuestras cascadas, de nuestras montañas, de nuestras lagunas, ya que la explotación petrolera ha ocasionado grandes daños, caso Chevron, Texaco, y recientemente crudo que hubo, que se realizó en los ríos Napo y Coca, perjudicando a más de 27 mil pueblos indígenas quienes habitan a las orillas de, los, de estos dos ríos. Como también en la Amazonía Centro-Sur, han tratado de de realizar o construir una hidroeléctrica en el río Piatúa dentro del territorio quichua de Pastaza. Como también el bloque 22 intentaron a explotar, explorar y explotar el petróleo dentro del territorio Guaurani en el bloque 22. Como también en el bloque 28 que están tratando de de perforar y explotar petróleo. El bloque 28 queda entre, sobre todo en la provincia de Pastaza, es más o menos por el Parque Nacional de los Yanganates, que desde ahí salen millones de ojos de, de, de agua para dar origen sobre todo a los ríos Pastaza, Napo, Coca, Morona, por, eh, por tanto al, al río Marañón y al Amazonas. Era explotar el petróleo en ese territorio 
en, en, sobre todo en la Amazonía, Centro-Sur sería mortal para nosotros de extinción de pueblos. Como también las empresas mineras, madereras, entre otros, todo tipo de extractivismo que han tratado de ingresar de manera arbitraria, de manera inconsulta y respetando los derechos colectivos de la Constitución, como también de los tratados internacionales. Y esto ha sido gracias al financiamiento de las grandes corporaciones económicas en este, en este sentido, los bancos, que prácticamente solamente financian para poder explotar el, los, el petróleo, la minería hidroeléctrica, entre otros. Eso está pasando en Tundaime, en la provincia de Zamora, Chinchipe, una empresa que, ha, que está pues asentada en esa, en esa zona, en los territorios de los hermanos Shuar. Alicia ha violado todo tipo de derechos colectivos, derechos humanos. Por ejemplo, en cuando se dio el estado de excepción y el toque de queda en el Ecuador, las empresas transnacionales no lo respetaron este estado de excepción y el toque de queda. Simplemente continuaron trabajando con normalidad en toda la Amazonía ecuatoriana, tanto las empresas mineras, hidroeléctricas, petroleras. Eso fue las razones para que los pueblos indígenas nos contagiemos del COVID-19 y hoy en estos momentos están muriendo mucha gente, están contagiados mucha gente, hombres, mujeres, ancianos y ancianas, niños y niñas en toda la Amazonía ecuatoriana. Por lo tanto, nosotros como Confeña hemos venido luchando contra todo este tipo de atropello de nuestros derechos, pero las autoridades, sobre todo el gobierno nacional, no ha respetado los derechos colectivos, los derechos humanos que están en, el, en la Constitución, que los territorios de las nacionalidades tienen que ser respetados, como también los tratados internacionales que reza a favor de las nacionalidades y sus territorios. Esto ha sido gracias al financiamiento de distintos bancos en el mundo a las empresas transnacionales. Por lo tanto, los bancos, en vez de financiar a empresas petroleras, mineras, hidroeléctricas, a todo tipo de extractivismo tendrían que apoyar a las nacionalidades de la región amazónica ecuatoriana a los para que las nacionalidades emprendan otro tipo de desarrollo económico pero sin contaminación sin dañar las montañas los ríos las cascadas las lagunas esos bancos tendrían que financiar a las nacionalidades para que cuiden su territorio, para que hagan otro tipo de in, eh, innovación, sobre todo, por ejemplo, el turismo. We may have lost a bit of connection with Marlon, um, but let's wait a second to see if it comes back. Oh, he may have just dropped off. Oh, Marlon, te perdimos, pero parece que has vuelto. Estás en silencio. Marlon, estás en silencio. Puedes volver a poner el audio. Y así te escuchamos. Marlon, eh, por favor, reactive eso. Ahí creo que estamos bien, estamos de retorno. Ahora sí. Ahí estamos mm -hmm. bien. Ya. 
voy a puntualizar diciendo de que los bancos del mundo, las grandes corporaciones económicas, tendrían que dejar de financiar a estas empresas petroleras, mineras, hidroeléctricas, a todo tipo de extractivismo, porque simplemente serían cómplices de la destrucción, de destrucción de la madre naturaleza. Porque no solamente acabar con la Amazonía, no es solamente acabar con la vida de los pueblos indígenas, sino acabar con la vida de todos los pueblos del mundo, de todos los seres vivos del mundo entero. Porque ¿qué va a pasar un mundo sin agua, un mundo sin oxígeno, un mundo sin alimentos, un mundo sin biodiversidad, un mundo sin culturas? Sería un mundo simplemente muerto, perdido, un mundo perverso que solamente saquea, mata a la naturaleza, simplemente pensando en el poder económico, el poder capital. Por lo tanto, los bancos simplemente han venido apoyando al poder del capital, cumplen a, este, a, este, a estos intereses de los multinacionales. Por lo tanto, los bancos, en vez de financiar la destrucción del planeta, tendrían que financiar a los pueblos indígenas para su desarrollo, para el fortalecimiento, sobre todo el cuidado del medio ambiente. Que esté aquí, hasta aquí, los pueblos indígenas en la Amazonía ecuatoriana hemos veni venido defendiendo nuestra selva, nuestros territorios. Por lo tanto, pues, insto a todos los hermanos y hermanas del mundo, a los señores, a las autoridades, a los dueños de los bancos, no financien, porque si ustedes siguen financiando a, los, a las transnacionales, a las multinacionales, ustedes también van a vivir esta destrucción de la madre naturaleza. ¿Qué pasaría si los banqueros no tuvieran agua? ¿Qué pasaría si los banqueros no tuvieran oxígeno? Por lo tanto, yo creo que es el momento de cambiar el destino del mundo, el destino del planeta, por lo tanto, desde la Confederación de Nacionalidades Indígenas de la Amazonía Ecuatoriana, CONFEÑE, estamos aquí para defender la vida de la humanidad. Defender la naturaleza es defender la vida de la humanidad. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Marlon. Muchísimas gracias eh, por todas las palabras y, y todo el trabajo que hace. Thank you so much to Marlon uh, for all of of the work that he does and for his uh, very important um, words. Uh, it's absolutely necessary to understand uh, the perspective of, of the people who are being impacted by these policies um, and by these activities and really appreciate uh, Marlon's time. Uh, so now I'm going to pass uh, the mic, the proverbial mic, on to Tyson Miller uh, with Stand.Earth, uh, who's going to talk about the, the global campaign Go ahead, Tyson. And, and Alicia, please. Ah, thank you. Yes, share in the slides again. Thank you so much. Apologize for the background noise. Uh, I'll try and get that addressed in a sec here. But uh, thank you so much uh, for your for sharing your vision and for calling for what needs to happen. Um, it's an honor to be right with you and for you to be on this call. Um, before I dive into what's next uh, relative to the campaign, uh, I will just give a little bit of a background on the sacred headwaters as a whole and just perfect timing. Uh, uh, so uh, it's uh, Amazon sacred headwaters is an indigenous led um, initiative uh, by national initiative in Ecuador and Peru and with uh, allies such as Amazon watch stand on earth Fundacion Pachamama Pachamama Alliance and others and you know the indigenous federations are unified in their vision for an end to extraction, uh, expansion of, of oil, mining, and other um, extractive industries. Um, and part of that campaign is the international arm, which is connecting the oil uh, to the banks financing the flow of it, but also to the brands um, and, you know, regions that are, are, that are 
in the oil. Uh, Alicia, if you could advance the, the slide, that would be great. Um, one more, yeah. And so, one more, please. Um, they have put forth, a, and another one, sorry, uh, a, a declaration that was announced at COP25 in Madrid, um, really establishing very firmly their vision um, for this end to extraction, but also advancement of solutions pathways for this region. Um, and there's much more contained on the Amazon Sacred Headwaters website, so sacredwaters.org or cuencasagradas.org. And it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's hard to level of international coverage and visibility of the sacred headwaters uh, since that time in the course of the year. Uh, Reuters has been covering uh, the, the sacred headwaters in a variety of stories, starting with International Day of Biodiversity. Um, and then did a, a, a comprehensive coverage of the release of this report that got picked up by over 300 uh, news outlets uh, across uh, the world. Um, additionally, it's, it's interesting to see the ripple effects of this report and the findings. Uh, we just found out that uh, the Bloomberg Intelligence Report uh, is wrapping um, this specific report and um, some of their um, recommendations and intelligence to the financial sector um, so we're, we're happy to see that thing that the, the, there are ripple effects uh, from the report. So where we're at right now is we have engaged, we're in deep dialogue with five of the six um, banks. Right now the top six banks identified. Um, one bank, uh, probably after the, the spill um, in, in May, Rebel Bank um, stopped financing um, the oil trade, um, in, in their words, uh, permanently from the region and we're, we're engaged with uh, the other five of the, the, the top six banks to do two things. Essentially, right now for on the ground because of inappropriate response to the spill and the likelihood of future spills, indigenous federations and allies are saying there needs to be an end to current production until the government responses uh, adequately addressing, remediating the spill, preventing future, um, of future spills, fortifying the infrastructure, et cetera. So there's this, ask of the banks to, uh, for this, this mor moratorium in the short term. And in the long term, there's an ask for the banks to essentially, you know, have their pro some of their project finance and their trade finance uh, policy commitments line up and, and make a commitment to no financing of this oil unless the government of Ecuador um, commits to no new expansion uh, consistent uh, with uh, the Paris Climate Accords and the like. Um, so, that's in essence our ask uh, of the of the, the top six banks. Um, we are also in the process of reaching out to the remaining twelve banks who are still connected, but just to a much smaller amount, to about fifteen percent of the, the financing over the last decade of the oil from the region. So that's in process. Um, it's a short of engagement. We our our approach will be sort of hiding, kind of a leaders and last approach. We're hoping to uplift. Um, leadership uh, in this sector um, and are eager to do that uh, in, in the course of the dialogue with uh, the banks that we're connected with right now um, and our plan with allies in Europe and globally is to really shine a, a, a much brighter and wider spotlight on laggards and lack of leadership. Um, so we're in a, a very w a narrow window of, of engagement at the present moment. As was mentioned earlier, we're also a lot of this, this, this bank's research or this, this report and the findings came from a broader body of work that Angeline is also uh, leading and um, from Stan Research Group. And that's connecting the oil um, from the Amazon Sacred Headwaters region to California. Uh, there's one in 10 gallons pumped are from the region in, in state and connecting that oil to brands and other large institutions and trying to um, really advance um, policy solutions, but also the, the, the large institutions using the oil to push them to um, make commitments to, to stop, in essence, um, similar to the, the commitments we're aiming for with, with these financial institutions. Um, so that's kind of our international campaign in a nutshell. We are always, um, you know, our, one of our goals is to advance uh, strategic communications. And so, um, you know, that's obviously in connection with the, the new findings and the new, the new research, but and, and other means as well. Um, and really, it's, we are hopeful that this international part of the campaign helps to um, generate controversy, show leaders uh, in Ecuador, but also Peru, uh, that large institutions 
uh, are very concerned about the, the, the continuing and expanding march of extraction, the impacts on indigenous peoples and their, their rights, um, and to you know, chart a different course. So that's part of our strategy is to support that indigenous leadership and their demands um, and their vision on the ground. Uh, and at the same time to support the, you know, the lifting up of solutions pathways. Um, so there's uh, later on in the year, um, and I, I believe even later on in this week, um, uh, really wonderful allies on the ground and indigenous federations will be releasing um, solutions pathways, frameworks and visions for what is possible in this region, kind of dreaming a new dream. And so this international campaign work, you know, connecting the controversy is really designed to end of the day support those solutions um, on the ground. So with that, I'll, I'll kick it back to you, Moira. Thank you so much, Tyson. Um, uh, next slide, Alicia, if you don't mind. A couple more slides to go. <laughs> Um, because I do want to uh, take advantage of my privilege as moderator to mention some additional work that Amazon Watch has done to track the financing of the oil industry in the Amazon. Yep, that's the, that's the right slide, the investing one. Yep, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so in March of this year, uh, Amazon Watch published a report called Investing in Amazon Crude, and we looked at the biggest US and European financiers of some of the most controversial oil extraction projects in the Western Amazon. And what we found was that uh, BlackRock, HSBC, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan Chase, and Citi were the top five US and European financial institutions invested in these uh, controversial companies. Um, to the tune of billions of dollars over the past few years. Um, and so we, I wanted to, to bring this into the conversation as well to, to be able to note that um, while the, the, the bulk of this presentation and of course the report that we, uh, that Sand and Amazon Watch uh, collaborated on together was focused on trade finance, there are other aspects of finance that are really important to, to pay attention to and are part of this bigger uh, conversation about the role of finance in either supporting human rights, uh, supporting climate action, supporting uh, the, the protection of biodiversity, or in, in harming all of those things. Um, and one more slide to that effect. Uh, thanks. So Stand uh, Amazon Watch and dozens of other organizations uh, released last week uh, a set of guidelines for financial institutions on how to actually be aligned with the Paris Accord in their lending. Um, you can find it at RAND.org slash principles. Our, our colleagues at Rainforest Action Network led this effort and so it's available on, on RAND's website. And um, I really wanted to draw folks' attention to this because we really wanted to uh, make clear what actions are required for finance giants to truly align the climate impact of their business practices with the Paris Agreement. Um, we know that banks uh, are starting to come out with, and we just saw from Morgan Stanley this week, an example, they're starting to come out with uh, uh, commitments to things like net zero um, and, and, and other terms that get thrown around. And, and those terms can sound positive, um, but they actually need to translate into concrete action. Um, and that's important both for climate protection as well as for the protection of, of extremely important ecosystems um, like, like the Amazon. Uh, so I will um, now move it on to, to questions. Um, Alicia, thank you so much for the slide help. You can uh, take down the slides that way we can see uh, all of the panelists because I think we'll probably jump around uh, between panelists for answering some of these questions. Um, I see a few more have come in, but I've noted um, several that have been popping up through the presentation. Um, and, and so first maybe let's go to Kevin. There are some questions about both um, the, the lawsuit that you mentioned with regards to the oil spill, um, if you can talk about where that was filed against, against or in what court, in what, in what jurisdiction. Um, and then um, there was another question about um, the fact that the Ecuadorian constitution has a rights of nature provision. Why, why are, uh, is the current administration so resistant to, to responding to this spill and to, and to indigenous communities? Um, and then we have some uh, other questions about um, sort of examples of, of success. How do we know that we're, that we're um, being successful in, in, in our efforts to, to push back against this destruction? And then we'll move on to some of the other questions. Thanks. 
Sure, great. Um, thanks, Moira, and thanks you all for these questions. Um, yeah, I mean, quickly on the spill, the the, the lawsuit um, on the oil spill, it, it's basically it was filed. It, it's it's actually for emergency kind of precautionary measures, right? Um, and it was basically filed calling for that from um, from the Ministry of Health, Environment, Hydrocarbons, and then specifically at the Ecuador State. Uh, run oil company Petro Ecuador and then OCP, which is the operator of the second pipeline. It's a consortium. There's seven different companies that are part of that consortium. So, you know, it, it was basically asking for kind of emergency like injunctive relief um, and th that would provide more resources to um, to the communities and um, yeah, and, and proper proper cleanup. Um, I believe it was a week and a half ago that um, that order was rejected by uh, the court in in the Amazon um, in the in the province of um, Sucumbíos in the town of Coca. Um, so that was rejected. The communities are um, planning on appealing, um, but you know the government is basically the judicial system has been dragging its feet. They haven't even provided the final verdict in written form to the communities, which is the legal obligation to do within 24 hours. They haven't complied with that. You know we're now almost two weeks out, um, and that's preventing them from filing their um, their appeal. So you know we kind of have a scenario where um, you know not surprisingly, right? But um, in this case, it seems like the the um, judiciary was, is very much being um, manipulated and controlled by um, the influence of industry, right? Um, and, you know, the other lawsuit that I, I made reference to was obviously the Chevron litigation, which, you know, I think many people know and have probably filed, right? But that was where an Ecuadorian court found Chevron um, basically liable for, you know, 9.5 billion. Chevron has refused to pay or clean up, pulled its assets out of the country and is still basically on the run. Um, and it's forced communities to try to go after their assets in, in other countries. Um, on the rights of nature question, I mean, that's a great one. Um, you know, I, Ecuador was the first country to um, enshrine rights of nature into their, into their constitution. Um, and I think there were a lot of high hopes that, um, you know, that that would really provide a sort of effective measure um, of, of holding companies and government to account. Um, Unfortunately, it, it hasn't, um, you know, it is being used in, in several different legal cases. Um, but at this point, you know, it, it, you know, I think in practice, we've just seen that it has not, um, you know, while it's great on paper, it has not really provided the kind of, um, you know, unique and necessary protection for uh, sort of ecosystems as a whole and, and to sort of do what it should, right? It was, it was trying to turn nature from, uh, an object of rights into a subject, um, right? And and that it just has not played out, unfortunately. Um, the good thing is that it's there, right? And, and you would hope that um, the judiciary or, you know, administrations, you know, in the future would, you know, that will be respected. Um, it, it, yeah, it hasn't. But uh, again, I think it's still a really important tool uh, that's there. And I think, it, you know, as we know, it's inspired um, and was in part inspired from a movement around rights of nature that's happening all over, you know, in local municipalities in the United States to, you know, New Zealand and, and all around. So, um, and then a couple of things, I mean, examples of, of, of victories. I mean, I think it's important to, you know, to sort of, to take a step back, right? And if you looked, I mean, I've been at Amazon Watch for 20 years. I've worked in the region um, for probably 25. And I remember, you know, that some of the plans that were on the books for the Amazon back then, I mean, had the government and companies had their way, um, there would be no pristine forest left in Ecuador, right? Like um, they wanted um, oil and inf energy infrastructure um, and that of other extractive industries like mining and dams um, to, you know, to basically take over the whole, the whole Amazon, right? That was the plan. And I think, you know, while, you know, in my presentation, we looked at that map and they have, you know, you look at all those oil blocks that are up for auction. Um, and yeah, that's a really scary, you know, scary prospect. And it's important to know that, um, you know, the government has been trying to auction those blocks for 
for many number of years, right? And the list of companies that have pulled out of the Ecuadorian Amazon because, and the Peruvian Amazon because of indigenous resistance, I mean, there's, there's a lot of them, right? You got ConocoPhillips, Arco, Burlington Resources, CGC, Geopark, Talisman. Um, and I think what happens, and so we know, right, that, that the, the areas that we're talking about are not permanently protected. So we're sort of in a scenario where, you know, we, we, you know, we're forcing these companies out. And yeah, that means that another company may come in. But what's happening over time is it's creating a legacy of controversy that ends up dissuading new investment. So these areas are, are becoming, you know, they're on the radar of companies of like, that is a bad place to do business, right? And I think that um, the report from the Bloomberg analysts that, that Tyson mentioned underscores exactly that point. This is a bad place to do business. You know, not only because, you know, it's gonna, um, you know, it affects your brand and what have you, um, but also the very risk that these projects aren't gonna move forward. In Ecuador, there's a case recently too, Andes Petroleum, right, which is a, um, a basically a company comprised of a Chinese National Petroleum Company, um, CNPC and Sinopec, right, two, two state-run companies. Um, they had a contract, a four-year exploration contract to drill for oil in two blocks, blocks 79, 79 and 83, um, on the territory of the Zapata uh, Indigenous Nation, um, you know, 400,000 hectares uh, of, of pristine roadless rainforest. Um, and the company had to declare force mayor. Uh, and they were recently granted that uh, designation and are getting out of their contract because you know, the force mayor, mayor that happened was indigenous resistance. They got this contract and they couldn't get any work done because indigenous people took over the airstrips. They prevented planes from coming in. Um, and there were international actions. We did actions at the Chinese embassy um, here in the Bay Area. There were actions in New York, in Washington. And so I, I think the, um, and I'll stop with this, but I, I think, you know, as we know with everything, there's no silver bullet, right, to how this stuff works. And you need to, it's sort of a, the recipe of, of, how, um, of how you win is complex. But I think uh, over the years, we've figured out that, that there are some elements that you certainly need to be happening, right? And it starts with on the ground capacity building um, and, and on the ground organizing and resistance. And then you combine that with, I think, some of the work that our NGOs are doing, which, you know, internationally pressuring the companies, pressuring the banks, pressuring the traders. And, you know, you combine all of that um, and as well looking at California as the major consumer of this, of, of crew that's coming. I mean, that's another area that um, we are, are, that we are working to push California as, you know, who has the market share of this crew to also take action. So, you know, you combine all of those and um, these are giving us benchmarks, even though that, you know, there's a lot that is being planned, but I think, um, I think we're advancing and, and, you know, again, the goal is permanent protection. Um, but all these victories along the way are, are helpful at dissuading um, at least some of the worst projects from happening. Thanks so much, Kevin. That was really helpful. Um, we have uh, several questions that get to the issue of, of how we actually hold uh, the financiers accountable, um, whether there are legal restrictions that can be put on them, and then also questions about how, um, whether it's more impactful to go after sort of the biggest investors, the, the investors with the most money, or those, the smaller, that, the smaller investors that maybe are a little bit more, move, you know, a little bit more um, potentially movable, or that have more of a socially responsible bent to begin with. Um, uh, maybe Tyson, would you be willing to, to to start off with those? And of course, you can always tag another panelist if you'd like. Sure, I think it's a great question, and pursuing a both and strategy. Um, as mentioned uh, prior, the top six banks identified represent about eighty five percent of the the trade financing. So we kind of have focused there, um, and. Next is the outreach and engagement with uh, 12 other institutions that collectively represent about 15% of that volume. So we'll be, we'll be doing both, it's a great question. I mean, hopefully we can see real meaningful, concrete um, leadership that we can uplift and it'll sort of create some ripple effects. Was there another question, Mara? 
Yeah, just sort of about what are the most effective ways to try to hold uh, these financial institutions accountable, whether it's legal uh, mechanisms through the UN, public pressure, what do you think are the most effective ways? I mean, I think for a lot of um, institutions, I don't know that there's, well, I think there is some legal risk, actually. Um, I think I think we need to sort of explore that in a more robust way. Um, but for the most part, I think it's it's a risk uh, to their brands. And a lot of these these banks have um, policies that are meant to be focused on their project finance, and it might touch on you know non impacting biodiversity or national parks or of course indigenous rights. And so if if there's if the loophole is trade finance, there's not integrity. That there's a violation of the spirit of the policy. And so our strategy is drawing attention to that discrepancy and targeting their brands. And then, you know, there is their, you know, they have folks that, you know, likely asset managers and others um, connected to, to them. And so, um, you know, we're, we're in the midst of refinement of our strategy, but the, the early stage here is, 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 is focusing on them and their brands um, and the lack of integrity here. Angelina, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or Kevin. Okay, I'm not seeing Angelina or Kevin jump in. <laughs> Thanks, Tyson. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Maybe I will uh, punt that to Angeline um, about um, about uh, how 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 the debt that Ecuador holds plays into this, um, and um, uh, and also if you want to speak to a question about um, is there a good bank that we know isn't invested in, in deforestation um, and other problematic things, um, if you feel willing to answer that too. And if not, I can try to take a, an effort at it. Do the first question because I have a short answer. Uh, the second question first because I have a short answer for that, which is I'm not sure that all banks themselves would know if they're involved in deforestation or in environmental destruction through their financing practices. Um, when we approached banks, they were surprised in some cases to, to know that we could trace trade financing. So I, I can't answer the question and say that there are banks that would be, you know, completely clean um, of, of any kind of, uh, of um, accountability in, with regards to environmental destruction. But I also would say we're not sure that the banks themselves would know in every case. Um, on the second question about Ecuador's debt, yeah, um, there is a, an interesting uh, dynamic that happens, and I touched on it a little bit in my presentation, about uh, commodity producing countries, and they get locked into like a resource curse, it's been called, where they're having to produce more and more and may, forcing more of their GDP to be focused on single commodities but actually they're borrowing money against those commodities at the same time. And so they're forced to keep producing despite the fact that they may not be profiting. Um, and this type of interaction is not unique to Ecuador, but it certainly highlights the fact that if Ecuador has, um, as they have done, uh, um, debt for oil swaps or oil back loans, they essentially have committed to daylighting um, oil in the country in order to pay back the, com the country's debt. And that means that they're forced in a way to continue to extract oil, despite potentially not profiting or potentially having dire environmental consequences for Ecuadorian people. Um, and that means that there is a, a link that needs to be broken between either oil back loans in the case of Ecuador, or if, or if you look at Venezuela, it's prepayment for oil. They're, they're borrowing money from midstream traders, not borrowing, but they're accepting payment from midstream traders for their oil four years in advance. And so they're locked in to extracting this oil, no matter what the market's doing. And with some caveats on that, but just to be very broad and, and succinct, they're, the they can, we cannot solve the oil extraction problem for the Amazon without also understanding the, the inequalities between first world profiting banks and midstream traders profiting from the trade in commodities that come from the developing world. And I touched on that a little bit. It's a very complicated interaction that exists in supply chains, um, but it, it does have to do with the transit trade through countries like Switzerland 
um, and the uh, financial flows and profits out of developing nations, um, um, their resource revenues are not staying in the country. And that, that has to be solved as well for really for, for countries like Ecuador to have a chance at some longer term economic vision that could um, include um, them having a, a real sovereignty over how they, um, how they extract or manage or sustainably develop their resources. Thank you, Angeline. Um, I, I believe Marlon is still uh, here and I wanted to give him the opportunity to answer some of the questions about indigenous land rights. Uh, so folks, if you need interpretation into Spanish, make sure, sure you have that option turned on. Uh, Marlon, estás, eh, ¿estás ahí? ¿Podría responder a una pregunta sobre los derechos de los pueblos indígenas eh, y derechos territoriales? Okay, he may be logged on but not paying attention, <laughs> which is fair. Marlon, eh, ¿me escucha? Marlon, ¿está ahí, por favor? Okay. Seems like he is uh, not uh, not focused on this, which is totally understandable. He has a lot going on as the president of the Ecuadorian Indigenous Federation of the Amazon. Um, so we can uh, we can go back to um, some other answering some of the other questions in our last few minutes here. Um, so uh, let me see. Oh, Marlon, sigue ahí. <laughs> Excelente. Marlon, eh, hay unas preguntas uh, acerca de los, eh, preguntando sobre eh, lo que existe en cuanto a derechos de los pueblos indígenas, a uh, sus derechos territoriales. Eh, si ¿sí podré explicar un poco eh, el panorama de, de lo que existe en cuanto a los derechos de los pueblos indígenas en Ecuador y, y las maneras en que se está eh, eh, exigiendo los derechos. A ver, nosotros exigimos nuestros derechos sobre todo lo que está en la Constitución del Ecuador, en los de derechos colectivos, el artículo 57, que dice de que los territorios de las nacionalidades, sobre todo los pueblos indígenas o las comunidades indígenas, no serán desplazados de sus territorios y muchas veces se han desplazado de sus territorios. Por ejemplo, en... en en Tundaime, en Nanquín, nuestros compañeros fueron desplazados de sus territorios, desalojados de sus territorios, obedeciendo sobre todo a los grandes capitales económicos de las transnacionales. Eso ha sido uno de los errores que se ha cometido. Y en la Constitución dice, por ejemplo, tiene que ver consulta previa, libre e informada, consentimiento libre. Eso no ha existido. No existe. Por ejemplo, en la Constitución dice, en, en, en la consulta popular del Ecuador, se dijo que se respeten los derechos territoriales de nuestros hermanos pueblos libres, tagaeres y taromenanes, pero sin embargo, la carretera avanza a los territorios de, de estos hermanos en, allá en el Yasuní. Entonces, ahí no hay derecho. Nosotros exigimos que exista la verdadera, sobre todo el verdadero, verdadera consulta previa, libre e informada, de consentimiento libre. Pero en todas las, todos los territorios de las nacionalidades, las nacionalidades hemos dicho... No a explotación petrolera, minera e hidroeléctrica, sino emplear, ir por otro desarrollo. Eso no se ha respetado. No se respeta ni la Constitución del Ecuador, ni los tratados internacionales. Simplemente los pueblos indígenas estamos eh, desamparados por las autoridades, porque las autoridades salen a favor de transnacionales. Los señores jueces... Los señores fiscales, las autoridades competentes del Ecuador salen a favor de las autoridades. Lo que pasó en la provincia de Orellana por este derrame del crudo, que, eh, que produjo en, en, sobre todo en los ríos Napo y Coca, el señor juez, el señor juez, eh, 
Jaime Oña salió a favor de OCP y como también de Petro Ecuador. Eso quiere decir que el Estado no reconoce sus errores que está cometiendo, de los errores que están cometiendo porque mucha gente se está muriendo de diferentes enfermedades, por ejemplo, el cáncer. Ahí el Ministerio de Salud no actúa. Por ejemplo, eh, el, eh, sobre todo el ministerio, los ministerios referentes, encargados, Ministerio de Hidrocarburos, entre otros ministerios, ellos niegan de, de que hubo, niegan el, el derrame del crudo que se produjo en, en, por estas tierras, por, estos, eh, por, las, por los territorios de las nacionalidades. También, por eso al conocer todos estos, estos atropellos a los derechos humanos, nosotros hemos, desde la Confeñé, hemos llevado adelante en la iniciativa de las cuencas sagradas, Hemos llegado a un acuerdo con la selva peruana entre Aidecep y Confeñay para dejar bajo tierra todo tipo de extractivismo y optar por otro desarrollo sin contaminación, sin destruir nuestros territorios. Hay algunas experiencias que hay en el territorio de Achuar, por ejemplo, con el Hotel Capavi, en, en, en Limoncocha, hay tantas iniciativas que sí dan resultado pero a los estados, sobre todo al estado ecuatoriano, al gobierno nacional, lo que le interesa es destruir la naturaleza y extraer el petróleo, todo tipo de minerales existentes dentro de los territorios de las nacionalidades, pero sin consulta. Y por, por eso, como no hay consulta, nosotros salimos a protestar a la resistencia y cuando nosotros salimos a rechazar la actividad petrolera, minero, hidro, hidroeléctrica en nuestros territorios, nos dicen de todo que nosotros somos eh, terroristas, que somos enemigos del desarrollo, nos criminalizan, nos meten a la cárcel, más juicios, entre otros. Por lo tanto, pues esto nosotros sí hacemos énfasis de que se tiene que optar otro desarrollo, porque otro desarrollo en los territorios de las nacionalidades sí es posible, y no al extractivismo en los territorios de las nacionalidades, porque sí han venido vulnerando los derechos y van a seguir vulnerando los derechos de los territorios de las nacionalidades de los pueblos indígenas de la Amazonía ecuatoriana. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Marlon. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Marlon. Um, unfortunately, we have reached the end of our time for this webinar, um, so we are going to have to wrap up. There are some really interesting questions uh, left, most of which are getting answered um, in writing by my colleagues. Um, and I just want to close on a, a quick note, emphasizing um, something that Marlon said. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of uh, rights on paper in the Constitution or in the laws, but uh, in fact, those aren't being upheld and respected by governments um, a lot of times. And that's part of why we need to be able to and, uh, push them, whether it's in protest, whether it's in uh, public pressure, uh, whether it's in um, naming and shaming, um, so that uh, companies and governments are actually uh, responding to the needs of, of the people and, to our, and, and of our planet. Um, so I thank you so much um, for, uh, for your time, for your attention. Um, you can contact either of our organizations via our websites, amazonwatch.org and stand.earth. Um, and um, please take care and be safe.